how to develop a Zelda like with 3JS. You're on the Night Coder channel and in this third tutorial we'll start animating a character and always in pure JavaScript. Here we go. In the latest video, we see how to use a physics engine and joystick to move a character through a level. For the moment, the character is represented by a simple mesh. The aim of this video is to use a true character with animations. We're in luck because 3JS supports animation of meshes, deformable geometries, and skeletons. Before getting started, let's have a look at Blender. First step, modeling. From a developer's point of view, we are defining the points that make up the character's geometry. In short, we are generating an array containing all our character's vertices. In this case, I'm doing low poly. I'm trying to reduce the size of the array I'm going to generate as much as possible. That's it for the first step. I finished modeling the character. Step two, mapping. For each vertex, we define the projection coordinates of a texture. The main challenge is to make the best use of the texture space. So much for projecting polygons onto the texture. Step 3. Texturing. The texture is created either by drawing directly on the geometry or by using drawing software. Low poly geometric shapes have very little detail. It's the texture that simulates relief and detail. Here's the final result. Step 4. Generate the normal map. This is optional, but it improves the quality of lighting on surfaces. Very useful for low poly games. The final step is animation. We rig the character's geometry to an armature. From there, we manipulate the frame to create poses based on a timeline. 3Js interpolates between each pose to create an animation. At this stage, we have a character modeled, textured and animated. We can now import it into our game. Currently, our project loads a single file for both the level and the character. We will create two different loaders. A loader to retrieve level assets and a loader to retrieve animated character assets. The loader file contains both functions. The level instance takes meshes and colliders to build itself. This doesn't change and the player instance retrieves the character's meshes. All that remains is to modify the loader. The level loader no longer needs to load meshes for the player entity. It only returns scenery meshes and mesh colliders. Now I'm creating the entity loader. This will be used for the player and the mobs. As for the level, we download the GLB file. We extract the object 3D contained in the file. I create a clips property to get the animations associated with the object and return the object. I save and my character crosses the floor. This is normal. The player code is no longer appropriate. We'll fix that. The mesh no longer has a position relative to the level. It's up to us to assign it an initial position. I create a variable for its initial position. I raise it to prevent it from appearing in the ground. For the physical engine, I initialize the rigid body with the initial position. The physics engine manages the player's position. And on the visual side, there's no need to position the character's visual. Its position is already zero. I'm removing the cast shadow property because it's a mesh group with a skeleton. I save. It works, our character falls to the ground. We can move him around the level. But the absence of a shadow breaks the character's integration. I'm going to activate cast shadow for all entities that will be loaded into the game. How do I do this? The visual of an animated character is not a simple mesh. It's an object containing a skeleton and various meshes. Cast shadow must be activated for each mesh. I'll create a function that scans the character's assets. And for each mesh, I'll activate the cast shadow property. I import the function into the loader and I'm going to code this new function. As in the previous video, I place the tools in the functions file. I create the function. As parameters, we have the object 3D and the processing function. If mesh is selected, processing is triggered. If it's a skeleton or something else, we do nothing. We go down the component hierarchy. For each child, we call up the function recursively. The save. And it doesn't work. I made a typo. It's okay, the character has a drop shadow. Before moving on to animation, we'll take care of character orientation. We'll modify the visual update function. 
Currently, only the position is updated. We're going to add an orientation update. To do this, I'm going to look at the orientation of the controller's joystick. This property doesn't exist, so I'll have to create it. Open the controller file. I'll add a new property to the controller. I'll create a new getter. I'll calculate the angle as a function of the joystick's x, z value. For this operation, I'll add this function to the toolbox. Let's do some trigonometry. I declare the angle function with properties x, z. We take the arctangent of minus z on x plus pi2 to obtain the angle in the game frame. I save and our character is oriented on the x-axis. By default, the angle is null, but if I move the joystick, the character's orientation aligns with the movement. However, when I release the joystick, the orientation returns to zero. That's not what we want. We'll just add a condition. We'll change the orientation only when the character moves. Instead of testing xz, I'll create a new property. This kind of test is recurrent, and it's more practical to have a simple property. I go back to the controller, and I add the new property. If the absolute value of x or the absolute value of z is not zero, then the joystick is moving. The character moves and as soon as I release it, it keeps its orientation. However, the movement is jerky. It's too reactive. Copying the joystick orientation directly isn't very smooth. I'm going to improve that. How to make character movement smoother. The joystick moves on the x, z axis. On Argon's plane, the joystick's orientation is controlled by the player and the character's orientation is controlled by the game. Currently, the player's orientation simply copies the joystick's orientation. The character doesn't move naturally. The aim is to bring the character's orientation closer to that of the joystick. Instead of copying the orientation, with each frame we move closer to it. To do this, we divide the orientation gap by multiplying it by the dt of each frame and by a constant. With each frame, we reduce the deviation with this correction and will gradually work towards the joystick value. By adjusting the constant A, you can set the reactivity of the correction. To implement this, we need to calculate the shortest angular distance between the joystick and the character. Then multiply by dt and a constant. And once again, we need to create a function to calculate the angular distance. I create the function. As parameters, we have two angles. Angle 1 minus angle 2 plus pi modulo 2 pi minus pi. And we always stay between minus pi and pi. I save. And the game is blocked. I forgot the function argument. Same thing for update. It's even worse. I forgot the parameter at the root of the game. This faith works. The character's movements are fluid. We're starting to get something nice. We can move on to animation. We're on the class player. During construction, we initialize the character's physics, initialize the character's visuals, and I add initialization of animations. I create a new method. How does 3JS work for animations? What you need to understand. We have a 3D composition, our character. It's made up of meshes and a skeleton. Each of these 3D objects has three properties, position, orientation, scale. These three properties allow you to situate the state of a 3D object in space. In fact, these three properties are contained in a variable, a matrix. Each object 3D is associated with a matrix. During an animation, the values of this matrix change over time. An animation is an array of matrices that will be scrolled through as a function of time. Each element of the character follows its own matrix. In our case, the matrix of each bone will follow its own array, and this applies to every animation. In concrete terms, on the 3J side, we have a geometry in memory. We can use it to instantiate meshes, we can also instantiate skeletons, and to animate a 3D object, we'll instantiate a mixer. We'll send animation clips to the mixer, and it will make the link between the clips and the associated 3D objects. And if all goes well, it will create actions. Each action can trigger an animation sequence independently of the others. Two animations can be triggered at the same time, all animations at once. For example, one animation for the character's legs, one for the arms. In our case, we're going for simplicity. One state equals one animation. I'm not going to use the 3JS mixer directly. It's too verbose. 
we'll create an abstraction component to simplify the code. I start by importing the mixer component from 3GS. I create our abstraction component. Properties. The list of activatable animations. The 3JS mixer. Animations available in the GLB file and the current animation. I create the constructor. We instantiate a mixer that will be linked to the character's visual. I retrieve the clips associated with the character. Each animation must be initialized. Retrieve an available clip by name. Add it to the mixer to assign an animation sequence to the 3D composition associated with the mixer. Specify the duration of the animation and whether it's a loop or a single animation. Finally, we store the animation so that we can trigger it at will. Moving on quickly, I've created a find by name function. There's no point, 3JS already offers it. We can load animations. Now we're going to trigger it. We retrieve an animation by name. If another animation is running, we stop it. One animation at a time. If the animation is already active, we do nothing. Otherwise, we trigger the animation. Finally, we update the mixer. This is what manages the running of current animations. It reads the matrix arrays and interpolates the animation for each object 3D. The component is ready and we can now animate our character. On the character side, I import the animation manager. I add the names of the animations I want to use. Our instance has a new property, the animator. During initialization, we instantiate the animator. It will link to the character's visual. And now we can load each animation. Attack. Wait. Run. Keep a reference to the animator to access it. At each frame, we'll update the animations. If the player has triggered the attack button, then the attack animation is triggered. If the player uses the joystick, we trigger the move animation. If the player does nothing, then we trigger the wait animation. And don't forget to update the mixer every frame so that the current animation progresses. In terms of code, it couldn't be simpler. That's it. The character moves with animation. Suddenly the game is believable. You can attack. Movement, orientation and animation. You've got a living character. With the decor and colliders, the level is tangible. We've got the foundations for a Zelda-like game. To summarize, each entity initializes its physics, its 3D visuals, its animations. And during the game, it updates its physics, visuals and animation. In the next video, I'll be adding actions to the character and expanding the game's level. But, we'll focus on the game's audio. Sound effects depending on the type of ground, sound effects according to the character's action, and the game's atmosphere. As usual, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate. Don't forget to like, and above all to subscribe. It's Nightcoder, see you next time.